Welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us for this webinar and sharing some of your time with us. We're going to do a presentation today entitled The Expert Recommendations of the Use of Placental-Based Allografts in Podiatric Surgery. The presenters are going to be myself. I'm Dr. Matt Garofalos. I'm a podiatrist practicing in Chicago. I'm the Medical Director of Physician Surgery Care Center and Private Practice and Teaching in the VA System. We also are joined by Dr. Tony Iorio from New York. He's the Dean of Continuing Education and Chairman of the Department of Community Health and Medicine. He's the co-director of the Wound Clinic at Metropolitan Hospital and director of the Wound Care Clinic at MedAlliance Medical Center in New York. So thanks, Tony, for joining us. This program has been approved for one CME credit. That is provided by the North American Center for Continuing Medical Education, an HMP company, and it is supported by an educational grant from Memetics. Here are the learning objectives for this presentation. We're going to exa examine the science and role of placental-based allografts for the adjunct therapy when surgically managing wounds. We're going to determine patient populations such as the geriatric patient with multiple comorbidities that would benefit most from the use of placental allografts in complex surgical procedures. And we're going to explore via case studies some of the illustrations in using placental allografts in podiatric surgery. Okay, so let's get started, and we'll start with the history of placental-based allografts. They have been around for quite some time, well over 100 years. The first documented use of an amniotic membrane was at John Hopkins in 1910, used to treat dermal wounds. There have been other occasions since then where they've been used on burns and wounds in various settings. In the 1970s, it was thought that these had greater potential for use but we needed technology to take care of preservation issues, storage issues, and sterility issues. So there was limited use of amniotic membranes at that point. In the 1990s, we were able to then understand a little bit more about preservation and begin to use these products in ophthalmology. They were widely used in ophthalmology since the 1990s, well into the, 2000, the early 2000s, and about 2008, 2009, we began to use these in wound care using what we learned from ophthalmology as to what these brought to the table for us. Since we started using these, we have developed new technologies, including umbilical cord, amniotic fluid, and placental tissue matrix. Who knows where we're going next? There's probably more things in the pipeline and future technologies that will enable us to use the properties of amniotic membranes in many, many different ways. So why placental-based allografts? Well, we do know that they're a regulator for angiogenesis, which is important. They're anti-inflammatory and antibacterial, which is very important when we treat wounds. They act as a barrier and as an analgesic. They are inhibitor of fibrosis and scar tissue. They promote epithelialization. And one thing that's really key is they are non-immunogenic, which means the body will not react to an amniotic membrane and treat it as a foreign body. That won't happen. So in the published literature for purion processed of dehydrated human amniocorion membrane, they do contain essential growth factors, which are important. They modulate inflammation. They stimulate stem cell and other cell migration and proliferation. This enhances healing and it also supports angiogenesis. So when we look at placental tissues, all of these tissues are donated. The entire placenta, the amnion, the intermediate layer, the chorion, the amniotic stem cells, the placental collagen matrix, the umbilical cord with everything that it has, including the Wharton's jelly, the umbilical vessels, the cord blood, and the cord stem cells, as well as the amniotic fluid and the amniotic fluid stem cells. So these are all processed, and there's a variety of different processing mechanisms. They're cleansed, they're preserved, and they're sterilized in a variety of different ways. Cellular, from a cellular point of view, 
Cells can remain viable, cells are non-viable, sometimes intact, sometimes decellarized. They can be preserved via cryopreservation and dehydration and stored in either a frozen state or an ambient state. Sterility is done by either aseptic processing or terminal sterilization. We do know that in dehyd dehydrated human amniocorion membrane, there are no less than 285 regulatory proteins that have been identified so far. It's probably more, but at this point, these are the ones that we're working with and these are the ones that we know quite a bit about. What we do when we take this product and implant it into a chronic wound, we actually reset that wound. We actually allow that wound to start over again. Many of our patients who are compromised or they're diabetic do not have the ability on their own to produce many of these proteins because in their compromised state, those mechanisms just don't exist. So by implanting this product, we now provide them with the proteins they need to take a chronic wound out and allow it to heal quickly. If we look at the recruitment of stem cells, we can point to an interesting study called the mouse parabosis model. And in this model, we used two mice. One was dyed green, so all of that mouse's cells were green. The other is normal and they're identical. We then took the two and sewed them together as it were so that they shared the same circulatory system. Then on the mouse that was not dyed, we surgically wounded them three, in three areas and applied a dermal matrix in one, dehydrated amniocorion membrane in another, and in the sham, we didn't do anything. And what we're looking for is we're looking to see how stem cells were recruited to these wounds to enable them to heal quickly. What we discovered is that in the wound that contained the dehydrated amniocorion membrane, there was a significant recruitment of stem cells to that particular wound relative to the other two wounds so that that wound that contained the dehydrated amniocorion membrane got a greater recruitment of stem cells and allowed it to heal, therefore, with greater rapidity. We know that the recruitment of stem cells is important in cell proliferation as well as cytokine production. This also allows for rapid healing to be promoted. Now, there has been some discussion about live cell therapies. And there are some studies that done. This particular study looks at viability of live stem cells. And it was done looking at a chronic wound and the processing of cryopreserved amniotic membrane. We looked at the viability over a period of time. While many of these mesenchymal stem cells do indeed survive or can survive the preservation process, and most of them do not. The ones that do are then in, in vivo, in the lab, they, they may go on and live in the Petri dish. However, when introduced into a wound, a very hostile environment, they don't survive very long. And in this particular study, it shows that at day eight, there's only 8% viability of these mesenchymal stem cells. So they don't have a lot of viability long-term, unfortunately. Regulatory protein composition of this product is very important because we need to control MMPs. We've heard for many, many years now in wound care that the MMPs are out of control and do not allow the wound to progress to wound healing. What we do when we implant a dehydrated amniocorion membrane product is we introduce inhibitors to the MMPs at such a level that they are overpowered. In this particular case, we see that the inhibitors of MMPs outweigh the MMPs by a ratio of 28 to one. So we do a great job here in taking care of those MMPs that have been stalling wound progress over time 
and now we allow the wound to proceed to healing. Let's look at bioactivity in diabetic stem cells. We're wondering, is there a difference in the diabetic patient in their recruitment of the stem cells as opposed to somebody who does not have diabetes? Is that an issue? Because we see issues with folks with diabetes in so many other areas that we're wondering, is that an issue with their stem cells also? So a study has been done to look at normal adipose-derived stem cells and how they migrate. We add the, to those adipose-derived stem cells the dehydrated amniocorion membrane ex extract, and we see that there's excellent migration, there's excellent proliferation, and there's alteration of cytokine production. So we know in a healthy individual what happens. We then compare that to a type 1 diabetic patient and a type 2 diabetic patient, and what do we see? We see that when the dehydrated amniocorion membrane extract is provided to those adipose-derived stem cells, we get equal migration, proliferation, and alteration of the cytokine production. So we know that the diabetic stem cells are not altered by the diabetes. So that's a good sign. So that helps us quite a bit. So current research, there is plenty of research in this area right now. We're looking at cell proliferation and migration, looking at cytokine secretion, angiogenesis, immunomodulation, antioxidant capacity, antimicrobial activity, as well as biopreservation. So there's plenty of research done here for these products. We do have the angiogenic regulatory proteins, which are really important because we need to bring in new blood, blood cells, new capillaries, new red blood cells into this area to help it heal. And with the help of these growth factors, this is exactly what happens. So these are proteins that that, that wound does not have available as building blocks. And by using a product like this, implanting it into that wound, we provide these building blocks to provide new vessel formation to help that wound heal and produce granulation tissue. So if we look at the bioactivity, this is a little bioactivity summary of dehydrated amniocorion membrane. We take that with, this, with the cells and we wanna get prolifer proliferation, we wanna get migration, and we wanna get biosynthesis. What happens is we also recruit the fibroblasts, the endothelial cells, the epithelial cells. We recruit the hemoporotic stem cells, the bone marrow, mesenchymal stem cells, as well as the adipose tissue stem cells to increase the rate of proliferation, migration, and biosynthesis. So these, along with the amniotic membrane, allow that wound to jumpstart and to begin to heal. So if we look at cross-sections of amnion versus chorion, we can see that the amnion is smaller in, in size than the chorion. The chorion is a bit thicker. And if we look at some key growth factors, we see that the chorion has a greater percentage growth factors than the amnion. Roughly, the chorion has 80% of the growth factors. The amnion has 20% of the growth factors, with the exception of epineural growth factor. So if we use just an amnion product, we get 20% of the growth factors. If we use just a chorion product, we get 80% of the growth factors. If we use a amnion chorion product, we get 100% of the growth factors. And that's important. So when we look at the extracellular matrix, we see that it's structurally intact. So these cells in dehydrated amnion chorion membrane, the cells are actually intact. And that is the key to making this work. So it's not decellularized. The cells are still maintained. They contain the collagens that are important in wound healing. They contain elastin, laminin, fibronectin, the proteoglycans, and the glycoaminoglycans. They have some non-viable cells that interact within the membrane itself also. There is an intermediate layer in, in amniotic tissue its purpose is mechanical. It contributes less than 5% of the regular regulatory proteins. And in many products, it has been removed. In some products, it's been left intact. 
Usually to remove it, you have to be a little bit more aggressive in your cleansing technologies to remove it. However, sometimes in certain products it's there and in certain other products it has been removed. So if we look at the composition of placental based allografts, we can see that they're where they where they're from or how they're how they're used the form rather they're micronized perhaps or they're a thickened membrane the fluid is flowable and they they also have a decelerized placental matrix and we can see on this slide the differences in hyaluronic acid the differences in collagen and the differences in cytokines present in the type of preparations that we might use so when we use these different preparations we need to understand exactly what's going on in the area that we're going to use them and make sure that we're using the appropriate amniotic product for the appropriate wound type. So wound preparation is key. And we've learned this the hard way by not preparing wounds and putting on expensive products and they don't respond and we wonder why. But oral preparation is key. First of all, the wound should not be grossly infected. We need the proper, proper management, whether it's IV, oral, or topical. The wound must be debrided to bleeding viable tissue, and it must be debrided before every application of any of these products. So we want to remove the dead tissue. We want to remove the bio burden. We want to stimulate and renew the wound edge. And this allows us to also allow the growth factor receptors to become more prominent when we apply an amniotic membrane. So we must remove all the necrotic soft tissue. We must get rid of that tissue that where the highest bacterial counts are at. And debridement also allows the platelets to become activated and the platelets have growth factors too that aid us in healing these wounds. So there are studies to show, numerous studies to show, that debridement is important. And in wound care, debridement is key. Wilcox's most recent article in 2013 showed that higher frequency debridement improves healing outcomes. So not only do we debride a wound on initial presentation, but we must, absolutely must, debride a wound at every time we're going to do a new application. Not a big debridement but a little wound edge debridement to stimulate that wound edge. So when we put down a new graft, we're going to encourage a little bit of bleeding and a little bit of edge involvement to get this wound to close a little bit quicker. So we've taken these ideas in wound healing, originally from ophthalmology, and now in wound healing, and we take them and we translate them over to what we do surgically also. So let's look at some different types of surgeries. I have a few case studies here. Dr. Iorio will also give you a few case studies later on. So here's an area where we use a sheet of dehydrated amniocorium membrane. This is an aproneus, aproneus brevis repair. Now, the one place where we don't want scar tissue necessarily or adhesions is in a tendon repair. So what we do is we go ahead and do our tendon repair and then we take a sheet of amniotic membrane and wrap that tendon with the sheet. This allows, as it heals, to heal without adhesions and to make sure that that slides very nicely in the tendon sheet. It also cuts down on pain afterwards, discomfort, and helps the area heal with greater rapidity. We've also used it in a variety of different tendon lengthening procedures where we incorporate it into the lengthened part of the tendon and sew it in place. Here we're using it on an Achilles tendon lengthening. Here we're using it on an Achilles tendon repair and you can see this is a pretty substantial repair and yet we're still able, once that repair is completed, to wrap the area in in amniocorion membrane in order to help it heal better, faster, and with less scarring so we get no adhesions in that area. Because as you can see, we've done a, a pretty, pretty open surgical dissection here. 
we've taken what we've done in tendons and applied it to bone. Well, if it works in tendons, it should also work on bony procedures too. And so we thought about doing this in hallux regis when we do a modified valente procedure. Because what's the biggest drawback to a modified valente procedure is on the table it looks fantastic, but six months or a year down the road, they are totally fibrosed again and there's a loss of motion. So what we did is we looked at Valenti's original paper in 1976, and this is how he describes the procedure. And we wanna make sure that we can maintain the motion that we create on the operating table. So here's a case study of a patient that we used uh, Valenti on. And of course, we have to pick the worst possible patient. This is his fourth joint procedure on his first MPJ. Uh, so when we go in, as you can tell by the, the picture second from the left, there's not really a joint present, but through the dissection of the fibrotic tissue, we do indeed find the joint and we do the dissection and resection of the bony prominences down to form a Valente type procedure and increases range of motion. Now, in order to prevent adhesions and fibrosis, what we did at that point is we took dehydrated umbilical cord and sewed that into the joint space. Dehydrated umbilical cord, you can hold a needle very nicely and it acts as a perfect suture material to fold into that joint. And you can see by the x-ray, we've created enough joint space according to Valente and now we've proceeded to procure that motion and uh, a year down the road, he has the same motion that he had on the table, which was very nice. So we've gone ahead and it's become standard protocol to use amniotic products whenever we treat hallux limitus in order to ensure that we get better healing, great pain reduction afterwards. Postoperatively, these patients don't need, many of them don't need pain medications in our hands. And uh, we get great progress a year later or two years later. So that's uh, a nice little addition that we've discovered. Here's an interesting finding that we had come into the uh, our clinic. This patient comes in with a mass on their lower leg, uh, slowly getting larger and causing some pain just due to its size. A uh, patient comes in and says, this is bothering me, it's growing and I would like it taken care of. And we did the MRI and it's, uh, it, we're not sure whether it's benign or whether it's malignant, but we're thinking it's pretty well encapsulated. So hopefully it's benign. Picture on your left, demonstrates how it looked grossly. And then we went ahead and did our incision and slowly, gradually delivered it into the wound. And lo and behold, we got the whole thing out at one time and it turned out to be, we found out a week later, a pigmented neurofibroma, which is benign. So thank goodness. Our dilemma was that it was a very large space occupying lesion. And so we were left with a big hole in the patient's leg and we were looking at the tibia. And so we decided to fill it up with dehydrated amniocorion membrane because we wanted to decrease inflammation, decrease adhesions because there was a lot of space for adhesions to occur here. And um, we did that. What we were surprised is this patient did not need pain medication after the procedure. The patient went on to heal beautifully. This is his incision eight weeks post-op and had no symptoms and no pain that he took pain medication for. He took some Tylenol. That was about it. So we were very happy with the outcome of this. We did use it over bone after a lipoma resection also. Patient had a growing mass, another patient on the lower leg, six centimeters above the ankle. The decision was made to excise the mass and when we excised it, we noted that it was indeed resting right on the tibia itself. So we did the same thing we did in the other case. This mass isn't quite so big, but it was easily excised. There's the lipoma. And as we lifted it up, lo and behold, we see the tibia right there, which we didn't expect to see. We expected to see a little bit of soft tissue, but since we had exposed tibia, we covered it with dehydrated and amniocorion membrane, sewed in layers over that, and then closed the site, adding a little bit more dehydrated and amniocorion membrane along the incision as we closed it. 
this patient uh, two weeks post-op had very little swelling. The incision was healing beautifully without any complications. And um, three years down the road is doing fine without any, any issues at all. So let's see, if we're going to use this as an implant and we can use it to fill voids, how about this? We had a plantar fibroma resection and we know that when we do a plantar fibroma resection, you also need to resect part of the plantar fascia, which can be a little debilitating. So we said, well, we've got a plantar fibroma. We went, we looked at it, we took it out. And in that space that we made by taking out part of the plantar fascia, we took dehydrated umbilical cord and sewed that into the remainder of the plantar fascia and into that plantar space to fill that void. This is what the patient's foot looks like about 14 weeks post fibroma excision. And I put the arrow there so you can make sure you saw the incision because it looks fantastic. And as I'm palpating from lateral to medial, I'm expecting to fall into the deficit that was created by the resection of the fibroma with the plantar fascia. And indeed there's no deficit. It's completely filled in and it feels completely homogeneous which I was very surprised at, and the patient's having no discomfort, no pain, and is very active. So I asked the patient if on my dime, we could get a CAT scan, can't do an MRI, because she also has a pacemaker, a CAT scan of this and see what the tissue differentiation might be. And she agreed to that. And lo and behold, we did the CAT scan and we have homogenous tissue, which was profound. So that was really, we were very happy with that. Another place where we're using this is in tarsal tunnel surgery because the last place that you want fibrosis is in the tarsal tunnel after you've spent all that time and delicate work dissecting out the tibial nerve and its branches. You don't want to have to go back a second time and do it again. And you don't want the patient to have symptoms again. And also in heavier patients, these tend to dehiss and we don't want that. We want this to heal very nicely. So we started using dehydrated amniocorium membrane in small pieces in the tarsal canal. We also used umbilical cord in the tarsal canal as we closed. This allowed for excellent healing, no sequelae in these patients. We noticed that there were no dehiscences in these patients either, whereas prior to us using amniotic products in the tarsal canal, we did have some dehiscences in our heavier patients. But when we used amniotic products in the tarsal canal, we had, didn't have any. So we continue to use this as part of our standard protocol whenever we do tarsal tunnel surgeries. So an interesting few cases here that um, allow us to see some different methods of using these products. Let me turn it over to Dr. Iorio now to talk about um, his portion of the presentation and also go over his cases. Thank you, Dr. Garofalo. I enjoyed your lecture. It was totally very informative and uh, extremely helpful, which ties into the advancing and our next steps. So this afternoon, we're going to be speaking about the module of geoscience, geoscience. And geoscience is going to be the concept, the upcoming concept, where it shows that the aging biological aging process in control of and in the presence of chronic diseases in health is being rapidly increasing. Uh, over time, it had shown that the patients, the geriatric patients, are beginning to show multiple comorbidities. And some of these comorbidities uh, actually can benefit from the placental allografts. Uh, both medical, in medical and also in surgical procedures. So in the next half hour, I'm going to be bringing you through some of those examples and then also finish up with some of the cases in our geriatric population that has a lot of comorbid diseases and where placental-based products have their, uh, have their best uh, showing. So according to the U.S. Census Bureau, we are finding that the American aging population is on the rise. Currently, we have a little over 15%. In the next 20 years, that's going to go up by another uh, 10 million. 
And then in 40 years from now, we're going to see approximately 25% of our patient population being over the age of 65. And this is where the placental based allographs in the elderly with chronic disease is going to begin to show. We know that the number of elderly patients is growing at an unprecedented rate. We also know that the increase of the aging population is expected to have a direct impact on the incidence of age-related diseases and directly associated healthcare costs. We know that the use of amniotic tissue in both orthopedic and podiatric surgery has just begun to discuss, discover that, and it has been increasing over the, uh, over the last few years and hopefully will continue to increase at a rapid rate. So when we look at epidemiology and aging, we are not only looking at some of the comorbid diseases, but we're looking at historically the constant age and association with chronic diseases. We are also beginning to take a look at about 150,000 people will die, of which two thirds of them will actually have comorbid diseases. So if you look at it as a whole, we are looking at over 100 billion people, 100 million people in the United States that will be dying from comorbid diseases. Taking a look on the left-hand side, that cause of death we know is heart disease, but when we get down into the middle of the screen, you see diabetes, and diabetes is one of the problems in which we see as a podiatric clinician, physician, and surgeon, that these are the types of people who will be developing these comorbid diseases and associated with that, we'll, we will see lives that are lost. So as a healthcare provider, it, is, it, it, it behooves us not to begin to treat those types of uh, disease entities and to increase the quality of life to our patients. So aging and chronic disease go hand in hand. We see a lot of cardiovascular disease and its manifestations. We see a lot of diabetes and its complications, cancer to name a few, and musculoskeletal problems, which we are going to obviously concentrate on today. Because with that comes degenerative joint disease, osteoarthritis. We just heard about a case of a bunion procedure. We hear cases about hammer toe procedures and other midfoot and rear foot pathologies that can actually benefit for some of the allographs that we are about to review. So from a physiological point of view, aging is also very important. Yes, the top three, aging, heart disease, and cancer, again, go hand in hand. But as we are getting older, and as we are becoming more active, the geriatric population is doing more and doing more in later years of life. So by 85, it's not unlikely to see someone playing tennis uh, and can injure themselves, or someone who wants to play tennis uh, but can't because they're in joint pain and suffering. This is where we as clinicians can actually help that patient. So we're looking at the physiologically of aging and when we look at physiologically aging, we look at a number of things, a number of uh, models that actually discuss and tell us what's going on. Everything from inflammation all the way to stem cell exhaustion, also mitochondrial dysfunction all your, and cellular senescence. These are some of the markers in which the aging process or aging theories are built on. And we see the inflammation, we see the loss of proteid stasis, we see the loss of stem cell, and how we can supplement it with alternatives such as placental-based membranes. So let's take a look at the four subjects that we look at, the four areas in which we as podiatrists concentrate on. So we look at the musculoskeleton, the, the neurological, and also the um, dermatological. So within those, we look at bones, cartilage, and ligaments, and we see where there's an application of where placental-based membranes can best be utilized. And we see that over time, as people age, we begin to weather away and get a little shorter. We lose our protective cushion and we become more and more in pain. 
Similarly, in our joint, the cartilage, which tends to become thin, it wears down over time. This goes on to osteoarthritis and, of course, can go on to other degenerative joint disease, hallux luminous and hallux rigidus, which uh, Dr. G and myself will show you cases of where the uh, amnion membrane would benefit the patient. Ligaments and joints, they are very, very important because ligaments can uh, connect the bones, the bones form the joints, and these become less elastic. This makes the joint feel very stiff and very tight, and it makes people very less flexible, more prone to ambulatory injuries. And ligaments have a tendency to tear more easily because they lose all their elasticity, and they begin to become, as we become less active, and we underutilize them so that when we go to utilize them, they hurt. We also look at muscle and body fat. The muscle tone and the muscle strength tend to decrease as our age increases. Muscles can't contract as easily. And approximately, the, there's 10 to 15% in our adult life that that would that affects and reduces the mass and the strength of our muscles. So by age 75, the percentage of body fat typically doubles compared to that of adulthood. And this increases the death of, uh, of health, uh, the risk of health problems in old age. So diet and exercise do play a maximum role. However, at the same time, we need to be cognizant of our connective tissues, how we can best supplement those connective tissues with additive or adjunctive membranes that we have in our armamentarium. And lastly, talking about the dermatological, we know that the skin becomes thinner, less, less elastic, it can become drier, more fly, uh, friable, and actually can rip and tear it loses a lot of its collagen. And the collagen is actually what needs to be helpfully replaced. And we can show that in some of our voided cases where we want to put some adjunctive therapy or added therapy into the void of that skin. The fat layers, they also too become very wrinkled and become uh, a little bit less appear to be tolerant to cold and it also decreases. The sweat gland and of course the blood vessels also decrease. All of these things will be adding to uh, a storm. The musculoskeleton, which is our last discussion, will be on decline in the body mass fat. It will find out that degenerative joint disease will occur in the majority, almost 85% of patients over the age of 70, decreasing our ability to perform activities of daily living comfortably and also characteristics of some uh, degeneration within our cartilage and a subchondral uh, bone on x-ray will show some thickeningness and hibernation. Hence the reason why we should consider implementing uh, placental base, plate based grafts within as part of our uh, adjunctive therapy in surgery. And the degeneration which causes severe pain can also be limited in the elderly if we just concentrate and discuss what we need to do. So the question becomes, how does the aging process affect the disease process and how is the disease process affect aging? Well, aging itself is not a disease. It's like diabetes. You don't die from diabetes, you die from its complications. So therefore we need to look at a major risk factor of chronic diseases and we need to understand some of the things. And the way we do that is with the introduction of geoscience, which actually had started about seven years ago, which is a consensual group of all kinds of specialists who take a look at aging and gerontology and they take a different approach. Not only do they look at us getting older, but they also look at what causes that. Is it a genetic components and identify those? Is it a molecular component and how we can change the, uh, the biochemical and or the physiology part of it? And is it also on a cellular mechanism and looking into some of the uh, pathophysiology reasons of why we get it? Because it is a major risk factor and it does cause a lot of serious conditions and diseases in older people. So this is the model they came up with where we see this reciprocity, if I can say that, which we have the uh, aging biology and the aging physiology working hand in hand. We understand more diseases. 
we understand some of the biological factors which cause those disease. And now next step in this discussion would be to prevent things from happening. And if it's already too late, how can we primarily and secondarily consider treatment? And that's where we're gonna be spending and showing you examples on how we can treat this uh, in helping aid this and arresting this condition from uh, exacerbating itself. So that takes us now into the technology and placental tissues. Now, are all placental tissues created equal? And I'm gonna show you a uh, meta-analysis soon that's going to prove not. However, for today's purposes, I just wanna review with you some of the placental type tissues that I like to discuss, which we have been mentioning. The amniotic tissue, of course, is a modular of inflammation, and I, I don't want to repeat a lot of the things that were already said. However, whatever we did discuss earlier holds true for these types of tissues, where they do modulate inflammation. They do reduce scar tissue. This is very important, particularly when we do revisional surgery in our soft tissue and our bones. So this has a high uh, incidence of use. Uh, umbilical is another type where we rely on perhaps something of a thicker nature where it is used where we want to encapsulate something. Perhaps we want to encapsulate the head of a metatarsal or the base of a bone, or we want to fuse a, uh, a, a TC joint or a midfoot or a rear foot joint and to help us guarantee that we're going to get at least a little bit more advancement and let's say security in getting those under control. And lastly, placental discs, they come in powder form and these are the ones I may even consider more types of an injectable because there are so many different various forms of placental membrane grafts on the market that we look at them from the dehydrated all the way to the cryopreserved, all the way to the injectable amnion fluid, of which when you look at the dehydrated, you look into not only the dehydrated membrane, but also the micronized. So these are the different approaches. And not only that, each and every one of these tissues has a priority, uh, prioritized processing, which helps gently remove certain types of, of cells and keeps the remaining good cells in place. So when we evaluate some of these multiple products on the market, we need to know what types of products they are. And the, why, the reason why I like this particular one, again, for all the reasons that was, had been said, it actually does very well. When you look at a bilayer versus a single layer, and a single layer can be just the amnion, a bilayer can be in the amnion and the chorion. And again, the single layer can be just the chorion. So the mixture uh, is, is also comes into component. Do I use the amnion, which contains 20%? Do I use the uh, chorion, which is the 80% of the proteins and the growth factors and all the, the good um, the nutrients and the, nu and the important particles? Or do I use a single double layer, which is dehydrated amnion chorion, that contains the 20% amnion the f and the 80% of the curing growth factors? So these are the things in which we need to understand we, we speak about this dehydrated human amnion chorion membrane and which it contains all the things that has said by 50 times already, the extracellular matrix, the growth factors, the cytokines. And we know that it stimulates multiple types of tissues. It migrates and helps in proliferation, helps regulation. And what that does, it acts as a very strong attracting force by connecting or recruiting the cells. And in this particular case, the mesenchymal skin cells, which you see on the lower left is being attracted to or drawn to in order to form a new pool of tissue that could actually help and aid in this new supply of the growth factors and the advanced proteins. Some of the uses for which we have used this for, complicated wounds which have exposed bone and tendon, after cleaning it out and after uh, a few applications and doing good standard of care and good wound care, we spoke about earlier good debridement. So good debridement, and in addition to using adjunctive therapy, such as placental membranes, we are adding to this armamentarium of getting our good and advanced wound care healing up to speed, where the patient will improve on quality of life. 
Again, this can be used in conjunction with a simple uh, chylectomy procedure over the first metatarsal joint. And this patient has a 46-year-old woman who had some hallux rigidus, a form of degenerative joint disease at the first metatarsal, where was she also was a keloid former. So using a placental-based membrane would benefit the patient uh, and also the surgeon by decreasing the amount of scar and also decreasing the amount of inflammation. And um, it can be used in several ways. I've used it to, to close the joint, the capsule. I've also used it when I was closing some soft tissue to reduce the keloid along the skin and its under surfaces as well with great results. I've also used the injectable. When I spoke about the the uh, the one that you can inject the amniofil, this is a, this is a type of injection that has been written up in the literature and actually comes from the treatment of plantar fasciitis, which is a com, uh, confirmed study at the VA hospital by Dr. Stuck, who at the uh, Edward Hines VA Hospital came up with an algorithm which helps show that conservative care given to the patient who presents with plantar heel pain and moving on to advanced therapy over the next four to six months can be and should be used before surgical intervention. And here is the protocol for which uh, the VA had adopted and it uses the injectable form of the placental based membrane where it's reconstituted with regular saline in a one cc syringe and then it is injected with conservative care post injection the patient has limited amount of ambulation there may be a minimal amount of initial pain however over the next two to three days that initial pain usually subsides and resolves itself on its own. The patient gets reevaluated in one to two weeks. Again, remembering this, the, the anti-inflammatory effect is what's actually helping. This is a slide I wanted to introduce because a lot of studies that are, have been done in the ulcer areas, the diabetic foot and the venous leg ulcers, have been, uh, have been good level one studies of placental-based um, allographs, keeping in mind that this too can and should be applied to some of the more surgical manifestations that we are now introducing and trying to get more data, for which it's somewhat limited in our podiatric and orthopedic literature, but to increase that. So if you look at the first one, we're looking at, again, not all are considered the same. You have just plain amnio allografts, which there are three level one studies that show in the diabetic foot ulcers that it usually heals in the standard of care, obviously, and its run-in period and its 12-week endpoint shows that between 33 and 62 percent of the times the wounds will go on to successful healing. Then we talk about the double layer, the amnion chorion layer, for which there are eight studies, the most in any of the studies that have been performed. And this is your dehydrated human amnion chorion membrane that shows the range of 70 to 97 percent of closure within a 12-week period. Similarly, it talks about venous leg ulcers, but in another story, we can talk about that. And finally, the umbilical cord, we have one study with level one evidence. And that has also shown very successful and those I use for my thicker wounds as we will have probably one of the cases. But not all are considered equal and some are even more uh, potent than others in that it has the, the thickness and the viability that certain types of, 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 of cases and in pathologies. So let's talk about some of the real cases in the remaining 15 minutes. We'll talk about some of the cases, and I want to give credit to, to our staff of talented uh, podiatric physicians and our talented residents who have participated in a lot of the things in which we do at Metropolitan Hospital and also in private clinics. So I do want to reach out to them and thank them for their contribution to, uh, to some of these cases. This is the patient who was well known to me personally from an outside clinic. He was referred to me for an outside clinic for a non-healing ulceration. We have applied one 
uh, one application, uh, also a total contact cast. It took us a few weeks, but we finally got it to close on the right-hand side. He appeared in our Metropolitan Hospital Clinic as a 61-year-old male, well known to us with multiple foot deformity and probably osteomyelitis, Charcot foot, and of course had had multiple amputations. So with this history, we began to treat him and, and work him up medically, cure him for surgery, etc. And we discussed his options, surgical management, and more, including even amputation. So he returned to us in the, uh, the fall a year ago. At that time, we were planning to do laboratory studies, put him on IV, using all types of enzymatic debridding agents, taking all types of uh, non-invasive vascular studies, doing MRIs, and finally the patient had a, had a plan, we had a plan where the patient had a uh, TAL as well as a third stump amputation. We also put an antibiotic spacer here, and this is uh, an idea uh, an ideal situation where we went on to use an external fixator and was sent after that to the nursing facility. We had put on certain types of thicker use of our dehydrated human amnion, maybe two or three to close this wound. But after a while, if it doesn't begin to close, we begin to suspect other things. And sure enough, we were in the situation where even though we went on with the surgical procedure and to do biopsies and to do others, we found out that we suspected that there may be some osteomyelitis. So the surgeon at that time decided, well, he has this patient who now has osteomyelitis, the frame is on, where he's going to a nursing facility, what should we do? And that's always the issue. So we noticed that there was some dehiscence over the area and the patient was then uh, had the frame removed and on uh, the dehydrated uh, amnion chorion bilayer was then applied. So the patient completely healed after the frame was removed and after the application, keeping in mind that during this whole time, the patient was on IV antibiotics, non-weight bearing and in an assisted living facility. So all of the things we try to monitor to make sure that the patient would do well. He's doing extremely well now, seven months into it, and that he has uh, been pleased that he has been given his foot a second life and he's able to do more than what he could have done before and having no ulcerations makes him for a happy man. In the second case, I thought I'd introduce this because this is a very interesting case that came into us uh, upon recommendation uh, this was admitted into our Metropolitan City Hospital uh, almost two and a half months ago, and the, fee and the patient presented with COVID-19 symptoms. Everything was in favor that he had the pulmonary infiltrates and he had pneumonia and he had de uh, deep venous thrombosis and he was not doing well. We were consulted three days later because we noticed, or they noticed, that he had bilateral wounds on the dorsum of his foot, which was associated with blistering, keeping in mind that it was a different type of presentation than the COVID toe, which at this time was just beginning to come into discussion and play. We know now more than we had earlier. Initially, he presented to us and, um, and we treated these wounds. Um, he denied that he had taken some warm baths. However, as you will see on the next slide, they definitely uh, will look as though they are burns. Uh, and again, the patient being having comorbid diseases was then told that um, the patient needs to be intubated and therefore he's on a respirator. Uh, and please held off because there's nothing more that can be done. So you can see the fourth toe, which now we know is a COVID toe associated with this syndrome. We now know that it looks as though it's a burn. He was a poor historian, but he finally admits that it is a burn and that we are also under the impression that we were gonna to continue to use a dehydrated human amnion chorion membrane over that. However, we were told that he would probably not make it within the next week and that we were asked to uh, apply palliative conservative care and let him be at rest. And finally, after going through all of this, we did follow him an additional week. Uh, he went into uh, pleural effusion hematoma, 
he was, uh, he had it evacuated, he was intubated, uh, and it was very, put on antibiotics and became very bleak. Not hearing from them in about a month's time, he reported to us probably about before Memorial Day, and he went down to the rehab unit. He had successfully come out of that uh, two month of isolation. And on June 4th, again on the left, both right and left, you will see that that is what we are, the burn that or blister that he had had. It was then decided through the, um, the miraculous properties that we have that it, uh, on two occasions, the 11th and the 18th, were getting improvements. We did see a 50% improvement in two weeks. And then yesterday, it was our last day in which he came. And if you magnify this, you will see that he has full granulation tissue and the dressing was dry. And that he uh, it actually looks extremely good and the patient is ecstatic. So, so what happened here? Well, this is the whole idea of um, the, the cytokine storm management, uh, the cytokine release syndrome, where the storm seemed to be managed, call it what you may, but we're thinking that perhaps sometimes these uh, mesochymal stem cells are attracted to these host cells that actually need to go to the area that's needed, keeping in mind that it is and helps in angiogenesis. It also helps the immun immunopro uh, provision and provides good deregulation or downregulation of local uh, inflammation. It responded to nicely some of the high levels of the t TIMPs of the MMPs that we spoke about, some of the interferons and some of the um, offenders that created this. So all those good properties that we spoke about that are in the uh, graft have been utilized, implied, and put onto the patient to successfully show that it got that under control and had gone on to successful healing. In this third case given to our chief resident, he was going to do a fusion of one of the rear, uh, the rear foot joints. And in so doing, the TN joint, which was done in November 28th, Due to uh, arthritis, he began to show that there was pain over the area and the patient had been appropriately treated and uh, the surgery went on eventfully until one day we noticed that obviously through ambulation, through walking, this through age, through the porosity of the bone, through some of the physiological factors that we spoke about in the elderly patient, he developed a non-union. So with that non-union and confirmed on the CAT scan, that's confirmed on the MRIs, we know that that TN joint was needed to have hardware removal and to consider, a, to consider probably more of an orthodesis in a bone graft. And this was also shown, and, but it was shown that a allograft dermal matrix had been interposed Arthroplasty, interpositional arthroplasty has been done, and the literature supports that the treatment of failed revisional arthrodesis at the at the telonavicular joint can be comp can be complemented by the use of adjunctive therapy or additive therapy. And this is where the podiatric and the orthopedic literature is just about beginning to see the safety and the efficacy of some of the products that are in there to be used. And in a very small study of about 20, of about 14 patients, uh, most of those patients had reported a decrease, all of those patients reported a decreasing amount of pain postoperative. 64% of those patients reported an increased range of motion and the high percentage or the small percentage of 29% who had a recurrence actually stated, the author stated that there was no significant difference in either using fat, muscle, muscle belly and or using a, a biologic. So, in, so saying in the beginning stages, it can be utilized in certain types of surgeries, particularly revisional surgery, because it decreases the amount of scar, increases the amount of angiogenesis, and of course decreases the amount of pain. In this article, this patient, similar to others, he, an 81 year old, came in with a painful bunion. Not too much can be actually done. And over time, a bunionectomy had been performed and a clinical examination showed the signs of degeneration or helix limitus rigidus of that first joint.
On x-rays, we show that obviously uh, she sees that hallux ridges joint, and this is a one, and, and so the decision is what did we do and how we should accomplish it. And with this particular case, we usually take the capsule and we interpose it and into a uh, positional arthroplasty with the capsule, and older individuals seem to do very nicely. And we augmented this with a uh, dehydrated human amniotic chorea membrane or placental-based membrane to, again, decrease the amount of inflammation, to increase the amount of motion, to decrease the amount of pain, to decrease the amount of fibrosis of scar tissue. So this seemed to be very well. We aligned it properly. And this is, these are just some x-rays to show. And just to quote an article that um, metasocial head resections respond well to a cellular dermic matrix in foot and ankle in 2017, so that the allograph interposition was performed with a cellular dermal matrix, and it was wrapped around the metatarsal head and was secured through uh, suture holes or drill holes through the metatarsal neck. Again, for all those good purposes that we've been speaking about this morning, all of these things are coming into visual play. And according to the article, it was even incorporated when they did an H&E study of the biopsy of the metatarsal head, and they found that it incorporated very nicely in that uh, fibroblasts had been seen. And last case we are going to discuss is a patient who came into the ED who came in with a, um, an injury. He heard that pop and everyone knows that that pop is a sign of perhaps a uh, weakness in the plantar flex power and therefore we know what it is and actually went on to go Form, formulate our diagnosis, but the fact of the matter is it was a complete mid-substance rupture of the Achilles tendon, about 2.2 millimeter gap, and depending on your incisional choice and or your, your, your surgical procedure of choice, adjunctive therapy of utilizing the placental-based membrane not only within the tissue and the tendon to give it its support and to decrease the amount of scarring and increase the amount of motion, but also to prevent some keloid process which you can use in the subcutaneous tissue. And here is the study that shows that augmentation has been shown, this is the foot and ankle uh, surgery article that we quoted, that not only is surgery better than non-surgery, augmentation and the repair of the tissue and Achilles tendon serves to be, serves several studies uh, and purposes. So in closing, I'd like to discuss some of the key take home points that both Dr. Garofalos and myself have made, particularly when it comes to placental based membrane. Both the podiatric and the orthopedic surgeons have recently started to use this in our surgical procedures, even though it has been used well over 120 years in other types of disciplines. And in wound care, we are beginning to see it definitely has a place now in geriatric surgeries with patients in, with comorbid diseases to be highly considered. When it's used in tendinopathies, these allow for an increased angiogenesis and decreased amount of pain, which is vitally important, particularly as we get older and want to walk and have better motion and better stability. And of course, the scientific, scientific literature supports the use to reduce inflammation and scarring. So we might as well uh, begin to do some uh, more research that has, has to be done because even though the current literature shows that the grass is promising, still more high levels of clinical trials are required. So in conclusion, placental base are great tools for any foot and ankle surgeon. The decreasing in inflammation and scarring and increasing in angiogenesis and the collagen disposition is well taken into account for bone and soft tissue. And again, even though the increasing body of evidence is to suggest placental membrane grafts, more research has to be done to justify their use in their, or in their consistent use of these products. With that, I thank you for your time and your attention.